de Titan, il y a un peu Given a pair of planar algebras, uh, P and Q, we can build a tensor product. This is a very simple thing. We just take the tensor product of uh, each of the individual vector spaces. Where I can put the there. So the nth vector space for P tensor Q, I'll suppress the pluses and minuses, is just the tensor product of the nth vector space for P and the nth vector space for Q, and planar tangles sort of act diagonally. Some tangle acting on an element of this vector space and an element of that vector space is just a tangle acting on two pieces separately across the same network. And so you should think here. Uh, of superimposing figures. So an element of the inbox space for the tensor product of planar algebra is just a p-picture overlaid on the top of a q-picture, not interacting at all. So like, you think maybe two layers of glass, the p-layer of glass and the top of the q-layer of glass. I mean, just, they just don't interact at all. Okay. And it corresponds, yeah. The, the, the words tensor product and free product for planar algebras are going to correspond exactly with the sub factor construction. Okay, so let's do a slightly more interesting sort of composite uh, thing instead of the tensor product. Let's now define the free product. Now, when I try and write down what the free product is, and uh, formally, it's going to look a little bit messy, but then we'll draw some pictures that explain everything. 
it's nice and clean. And this is just a very general thing. You can do this with any sort of planar algebra, shadings, no shadings, whatever you like. Uh, but one thing to be aware of is that this, the purely diagrammatic description I give here uh, makes it rather hard to see positivity on the free product of two uh, well, of two uh, of two unitary planar algebras. So just be aware that I'm kind of abandoning that for a moment while I give this example. Okay. So the nth vector space of the free product of P and Q is the following kind of messy thing. So it's going to be some big direct sum of the things that I'll call n paintings. And then inside this direct sum comes a tensor product of a contribution from P and a contribution from Q. And finally, we're going to take some big quotient to, to sort things out. So the tensor product for the, the P stuff is just that, well, an N painting is going to have some, some uh, P colored regions and some Q colored regions. We'll take the tensor product here over all of the P regions in our painting. Call that region R. Well, each region is going to have some number of, of boundary points for R. So we're just going to take the vector space associated to the, sort of the size of the perimeter of that P region. And of course, we do the same thing over here in the Q. So we can sort of work the Q regions of the vector spaces that Q associates with those. And then the big quotient here is actually just something very simple. It's just saying that we can take an empty P region and replace it with an empty Q region. So let me now say exactly what a painting is. And We'll, um, and I'll give you the definition. So in particular, an N painting is a division of a disk with four endpoints on the boundary. And those points already come labeled. Those four endpoints are labeled by an alternating, well, it means so often alternating words. It starts with P, then two Q's, then two P's, then two Q's, and so on. Finally, finishing with a P. Okay? So we take this disk with all its boundary points, and we divide it up into, Q region, into P regions and Q regions. Well, with boundary points in the appropriate For all of the key points around the boundary into line P. So let me just give an example. All those words aren't clear. Look through the picture, will we? So here are uh, some examples of two paintings. My disk. I guess I'll start using uh, orange for P and uh, green for Q in a moment. So uh, let's uh, have the dollar sign on our, on, our, on our base point there. So we're meant to start with P. So those are going to be my P points on the boundary. They're going to be my Q points on the boundary. And then uh, let me draw a painting. Divide the regions up like that. Let's see if I can shade through this. There we go. Okay. Okay. So there's a uh, painting. We can just maybe draw one more slightly more complicated one. And let's also draw some typical elements of this free product, say a free product of temporary leaf. 
take free credit. Uh, Tim Levy came to itself in the two box space. Well, let's say we could take something based on that, on that painting there. So we need to adapt to the formula to the fact that we have long term and then Oh, uh, oh, uh, think of that, did I? Um, Alternative thing, you could first take a planar algebra, each individual planar algebra, and pump it up to a better thing that, that gave you vector spaces for all planar surfaces. Uh, or you can just kind of you know, work that away. This quotient here it takes care of the, of the awkwardness of having different kinds of. Okay. Um, here's a sort of not so exciting element. Based on that first painting. And then uh, here are two elements that are equal because of the quotient. Uh, something I need to draw. These are pictures based on different paintings, but they're equal because of the quotient. Yeah. So let's uh, let's get so uh, so what's the what's going on here? Forget all the paintings. All that it's saying is that you draw p pictures in some regions and q pictures in other regions, and then don't pay attention to the regions if there's nothing there. And the the very first observation is, as Horn points out, that uh, that the free product sits inside the tensor product uh, as uh, as non-crossing superimposed pictures. So super, you, you can take a pair of superimposed pictures and move them slightly so they actually don't overlap at all, then it counts as an element of the domain. Okay. Now it's sitting inside there as a as a um, as a subplanar algebra. But maybe a better way to think of it is we can obtain uh, the tensor product from the free product uh, by adding an oops uh, by adding a generator that uh, it doesn't respect the the. This generator, obviously, in order for this to actually be the tensor product, is going to have to satisfy a whole lot of relations. Not only is it going to, have to act like a sort of vertical crossing, but we're going to have to be able to drag these crossings across arbitrary elements of the individual planar algebras. Okay. But if you do that, then you obtain uh, the tensor cube from the free product. Oh. And so this is what motivates our definition, which is just a composite. So the, the, the first observation to make about a planar algebra with the free product sitting inside of it is that it's got a very special element. 
we leave subalgebras of the two factors in the composite, so this is sitting inside the, uh, the, uh, the two box space, and it's a bifurcation uh, in the sense that to predict an optimal multiple in both directions can multiply. Sideways, you get the loop value in Q. That's right. And now the, uh, the, the nice theorem is that actually this is all you need to recognize a composite. Conversely, Any planar algebra F with a bifurcation starting with the planar algebra there, uh, we can construct uh, cutting things down by this bifurcation away. I won't say exactly. We can construct two other planar algebras B and Q and an inclusion. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting that email. I'm getting that, sorry. <laughs> the very next sentence on my, on my notes, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so this theory of, uh, of bifurcations and the fact that, uh, that composites are exactly the same as planar algebra with a bifurcation has been extensively developed by uh, Ian Maher and Malone. Uh, and they have, in fact, a, a nice series of papers, uh, which, uh, in fact, uh, in a way, but recently, and now and Emily and I have been imitating a slightly different setup where they uh, study uh, small planar algebras, that is, where the dimensions of the box spaces are small with a bad projection. Yeah. Okay, so that's the setting. Uh, if you if you're, want to study composites, you have to think about planar algebras with bad projections in them. But the question that, uh, that I want to ask is just how many composites uh, you should expect. So certainly any time you, you fix P and Q, you've got one composite, because you can always form the tensor product. But the question is what else? What else is there? Did you say what does the complex separation have on the wall of the complex? Like that one factor? Uh, um, I guess I don't know what to say directly. But you have to, yeah, you have to do a little bit. To sort of, I mean, you need a little bit of extra data to study. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, well, I mean, this, this, uh, I mean, this is uh, this, in, this inclusion is part of the data. If you just have two sort of entirely separate subfactors, A and set B and C and set D, then you can't just sort of keep anything out. Well, what am I trying to say? Um, what am I trying to say? Okay. Should we expect lots of composites? Really, all that I want to say. Uh, in this lecture is that we still don't really know, and this is sort of evidence in, in both directions. So, uh, if we look at a free product of groups, <coughs> say two free product, say one three, has infinitely many finite quotients, Using any of these, we can uh, we can build something a uh, fish hard group subfactor, fish hard group planar algebra, which is an example of one of these. So uh, here, so say we have uh, some finite quotient G, then we can work uh, 
we are working the tensor category uh, G-graded vector spaces, we, there we have two algebras, the, uh, the group ring of, uh, of the image of Z12 and the group ring uh, of the image of Z13, and the, the Bishhagra of Plano algebra. comes from just the sequence of inclusions of algebras in vec G. You can just look at A inside the group ring of G is certainly an algebra of the G graded vector spaces inside the group ring of G. Well, there's also a module over, uh, over this algebra, so tensor over B. And just as we saw yesterday, anytime you have this an inclusion of algebras uh, in as an offensive category, we build the kind of algebra from. These things are certainly all, uh, these, are all these are all going to be composite stuff, yeah, composite plan. Okay, so in that case, where we're starting in sort of the finite group world, maybe there are lots and lots of composites. But the other thing that I wanted to show you uh, is a recent result of, uh, of Jingwei Lu, which very surprisingly told us that in, uh, in other situations where we might have expected infinite many composites, there are in fact only one infinite. So this family uh, were uh, nominally known as uh, Dietmar's fish, I guess. Uh, he uh, he, uh, he sort of brought people's attention to them, and, uh, and uh, for a long time people didn't really know what was going on. Uh, so then we, uh, the setting before telling the statement of the result. So consider the fusion categories uh, A2 and T2. So this is just, uh, A2 is just this very boring category where the morphisms are just template leaf diagrams, modulo the relation that the loop is one, and you can change swing self your life, just as two simple objects. And T2, uh, the golden category, so for future, uh, maybe I should start color coding the screen again. A2 can have uh, orange streams, and uh, T2, this planar algebra is built out of trivalent graphs, modulo some relations that can circle the golden ratio, uh, and then there's some relation that lets you reduce adjacent. Minus or plus. Someone can correct the sign there. Okay, so I told you two extremely explicit fusion categories, or two, and you can just think of these as kind of shaded kind of algorithms. What composites are? Well, relatively quickly, just from this this setup. You can work out quite a lot about what such a composite would look like. So I'm going to sort of race through this argument, but it's it's just a little bit of combinatorics about the fusion rings, and then a little bit of thinking about the scheme theory of such a of such a composite. And we just <coughs> the conclusion. Uh, any composite. Some element u, so here uh, is u as uh, some number of, uh, of orange and green strings alternating around the boundary. And here there are uh, two n strings. Oh, sorry, not alternating. Um, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, uh, I really do want alternating. Sorry, I'm, 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 uh, I'm mixing things up a little bit and talking about composites of these unshaded uh, fusion categories. And to, to recover the result of that sub you have to tweak things up a little bit. But uh, in the free product, in the, in the planar algebra case, I always wanted to have pairs of strings. But in the unshaded case, you can tweak the strings. You want four ends. Four ends. Uh, 
there's a there would be an element like this satisfying a few relations. This guy is unitary, so it the top of up and top of the down, and multiply it by stuff. Go to one. And the following cube relations. So I guess we're a bunch of blank strings there to say I don't really care exactly. Say that I'm too lazy for all the colors. But if we see an orange string at the top that is a temporary leave string, we can just pull it off to the side. In exchange for replacing the original string. And if we see, on the other hand, a golden string at the top, something a little bit more complicated happens, but it's not too bad. So there's some parameter here, some sigma that I think says something. Star, pull the strings down, and then there's some more complicated diagram. Uh, so, yeah. Roll the string there, and something a little bit crazy here. It's going to make it feel a little bit strange that I'm claiming this isn't even theorem, but it really is. Exactly right. We get something like this. And my claim is that if any composite exists, you can derive relatively quickly that there would have to be some element satisfying a function relation. <laughs> so the argument that I'm giving here um, is not Zheng Wei's argument that, that all of these um, that all of these com uh, that only finite many of these composites don't exist, but rather a weaker, less awesome argument due to um, Masaki and Dave and myself that Dave Penny's so that only uh, that only proves that finally many of them don't exist, but uh, you need Genway's stronger result to prove that all of the rest can exist as well. But I want to give this argument because I think that from this point onwards, it's actually very it's actually conceptually very easy to see what's going on and what goes into the numbers. Okay, so the, what's the point of of, uh, of relations like this? Well, they're jellyfish relations. What do they say? If I have any uh, closed diagram built out of of, uh, of this generator U, when now I'm thinking of, of this trivalent vertex as somehow being less important, it's sort of this first order generator U that sort of defines the, the composite. But there are also these trivalent vertices, and I'm not worrying about those so much. What I can do using these relations is float all the U's out to the surface, so I can re replace my closed diagram with a much more complicated, or linear combination with much more complicated diagrams where all of the U's are out of the boundary. And then basically a little combinatorial counting argument about planar diagrams guarantees that somewhere in this configuration there's a pair of U's that are connected by enough strings that I can use that relation to, to reduce the number of U's, leaving the diagram in its jellyfish form. So since these are jellyfish relations, they determine the, they determine the category. The composite itself could be more complicated, but the thing generated by this new box that's guaranteed to exist, that planar algebra is entirely determined by whatever this n is and whatever this parameter sigma is, which is some degree. Okay? So all we need to do now is, is in those cases, try and try and open them. And the calculation turns out to be rather simple. The calculation is just that you are one version of it uh, is that you start with a little diagram with four copies of U connected up in a very simple way. Okay. Uh, this diagram can be evaluated in two ways. There's the sensible way in which you look at each of these pairs separately, and notice that it's a pair of views connected up by lots of strands. So uh, you use the first multiplication relation to just replace this by something in temporary leave, plus this lots of circles, and it up. Do the same thing with this one, and you get some, uh, some numerical multiple of the n in theory up in the Or we can evaluate it in a completely ridiculous way, which is to take this u here, and first of all, 
drag it all the way through the middle of that other pair of users. Okay? This is rather expensive, which is why our argument really only uh, uh, gets done in finite number of cases, because we want to turn around and see the pattern that works in general. But after you drag it through, you've got some big complicated diagram with views around the outside, and you can evaluate that too. Now, the observation is, uh, well, for n equals 1, 2, and 3, maybe I have not put one error there. Um, this looks fine. And indeed, we have realizations of the corresponding categories. This. But for uh, n4 through 10, this gives a contradiction. That is, the two different ways of evaluating the value simply give different answers. So, this is a, a nice application of the, of the jellyfish idea to show uh, non existence of something and use the jellyfish relations to revive it. One hopes, even, that the same argument could be used to show that the, the further extended hardware beyond extended hardware don't exist. If they existed, we know what the jellyfish relations for those would look like. And presumably, one could do a calculation exactly like this. In practice, it seems kind of very one else no one's attempted. But it could just give a, a direct instruction. So where does more of the decision category come from? Is it clear that you might result in um, I'm not absolutely sure. It, it, the, the two setups are pretty close, so I would uh, they probably know the fastest answer. Oh, okay. uh, if there is a, if the, so, if there is such a category, and it turns out this category has a convenient algebra object, which gives you the sub factor, and then John Wade's argument really does, and that explains the okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the the the. the the point is that the algebra object in this tensor category with this extra gal is just sort of the standard algebra object. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the generator that's used in the Okay, so maybe very briefly, just to advertise uh, a stronger result, by a very different means, he gets this for, for all n. Uh, and uh, he uses a very nice adaptation of the graph finite algebra Venn theorem. Uh, for the case of a composite of a composite planar algebra, where there's a, a slightly different result, and then he shows that there's just no way to uh, to embed this generator that must exist in this uh, special <coughs> algebra. Okay. So uh, the conclusion of that was that down in this corner, well, maybe we still don't really know what to expect. We've got examples of composites where there are infinitely many composites with various cell factors, but other examples. Okay, so at this point, I want to change that basically completely uh, and tell you what goes in to the ruling everything else rule, ruling everything else out part of the classification rules. So the idea is basically that we want to constrain all the possible principal graphs of, uh, of subfactors below some index. Now, uh, this, this sort of process has gone through a whole lot of iterations. Uh, and so below index 4, it's sort of a classical theorem that the, the graphs are just the ADE in the diagrams. But then, uh, Ukraine Hagru sort of kicked off the subject by, uh, by, by telling us what the possible principal graph and subfactors below index 3 plus story 3 were. And then there's been a whole sequence of steps where we've learned more things about the combinatorics of principal graph and subfactors. That has made it possible to go further and further and further. So, before I tell you uh, what that looks like these days, I just want to do a little bit of advertising for some other people's work. So, uh, since the classification up to index 5, there have been four new advances. together allowed us to go for. 
modulate this uh, theorem star up to index b plus square root 5, and in the special case of 1 super chances all the way up to 6.2. So let me just briefly list these things. Uh, anyway, has, uh, has some, uh, some fantastic results on, uh, on recognizing uh, intermediate subfactors. That is just looking at the principal graph, knowing that any subfactor with that principal graph must have an intermediate. And as soon as you've got an intermediate, uh, life gets dramatically better because you know then that your index is the product of two small index values. And that's, that's a really quickly constrained situation. So that's a, that's a paper on the archive. And then uh, Stephen Bigelow and uh, Dave Penny's result. The basic idea of this result is that if you, you see at some point, this is your, your crazy principal graph, but if you see at some particular, that's a bad place to draw, uh, if you see at some particular depth that uh, there's no forking, no fusing, that is all of the edges from these vertices that edges, or these vertices that edges stop, <coughs> continue on to exactly one vertex in the next step. This is called stability. There's no forking the result shows that it's stable at all remaining depths, and in fact, the principal graph is kind of stable. Uh, maybe at this point, it's a little hard to see why that's such a wonderful result, but it's very helpful in the classification. Uh, all, of these class all of these classification theorems for the principal graphs uh, have relied in various forms on what are known as triple point obstructions, going back to one initial group by by Adrian Alpiano, and then another one uh, by Vaughan, and then uh, a generalization of that by Noah Snyder, and then the, the, the most general form we have at the moment, Hugo David Pennies. It basically tells you just a bunch of combinatorial information about principal graphs that start with the, with the three bound vertex of the first floor. That's also on the archive. And then a student at an engineering computer science department uh, who has taught me a whole lot of things about combinatorial and enumeration of uh, things with like symmetry groups, which is in particular written some really nice programs. Uh, the enumerated principal graphs, given a whole list of certain conditions, swiftly guarantee that the list she's producing is, is asymptotic three. And this, uh, this radically speeds up all of our attempts to get the least possible instances. I'm going to, uh, yeah, these three things, I, I hope to have enough time in these, in these to talk about number two a little bit, but I'm just going to talk about the other Okay. So, what do we need to say today? It's been a while since anyone talked about exactly what a principal graph was, so let's uh, just remember some of the, if you're telling a graph theorist what a principal graph is, well, it's actually a pair of graphs, gamma plus and gamma minus, a pair of locally finite, connected, each component is connected, that is, uh, pointed, that is, there's a special base point for the start vertex and trivial by module. Uh, by car type, the division of the left A modules and left B modules, uh, graphs. Along with the evolution, uh, corresponding to taking the dual of the bi module, which is where I'm the sub factor. And then the point is that this, uh, this evolution takes even vertices from gamma i to vertices at the same depth on gamma i. That is, 
you can send the dual of an AA bind module is an AA bind module. And odd vertices, that is vertices of odd depthness, the vertices of the same depth on the other graph. This is called standard zero and gamma one. Okay. And then there's one more condition, which is just purely a combinatorial condition. So let's call this involution uh, bar. The combinatorial condition that sort of glues the graph and the involution together is the following. This is sort of a messy way to write it. That might emphasize that you know, part of the world of subfactors and planar algorithm are just in graph theory for a moment. So here, uh, X denotes the multi set of neighbors. So what's this saying? If you start with some vertex V on the graph, Take its dual vertex, and then take all of its neighbors, and then take all of their dual vertices, and then take all of their neighbors. You get the same thing as starting with the vertex, taking its neighbors, taking all the duals, taking all its neighbors, and taking the duals. What on earth is that expression? Back in the language of fine modules, with uh, capital X, say, our favorite fine module, this is just saying that X tensor A tensor X doesn't depend on how many tensors. Associativity of the two duals in this particular case, tensor X. And uh, so this condition here is called this is called the associativity. Okay. Now the final thing to say, well, so what are we trying to do at this point? We're now trying to classify all of these graphs, so all graphs satisfying those conditions, up to some index. Remember, the index of one of these graphs is just the square of its largest type. We've got D, L, D for uh, a set of principal graphs. The index of most L and depth, that is the greatest distance from the base point at most okay. We want to be able to enumerate the elements of these sets up to graph up to graph isomorphs. So it turns out that while you're trying to enumerate graphs, there's basically no information to enumerate. The important thing to think about is the theorem that if you take one, a graph like this and you add more stuff onto it, add new vertices and edges, then the, the, the eigenvalue, the index, can only increase. But you basically can't say anything about the, all the other entries of that. As you're building these graph two subtips, the, eigen, the eigenvector of the index and some matrix pretty much carries no information. Okay. So say the associativity condition holds Two vertices P and, uh, V and W. Uh, the multiplicity of W <coughs> in the associativity condition we end up here. Multiplicities. So let's define a partial principal graph. Principal graph of a pair, an honest principal graph, some minor modification, and an integer n, where n is either the depth of the principal graph or just one more than the depth, except uh, associativity. Hold 
discover you. If, uh, if those are either both n minus 1, both n, or 1 of n minus 2, and 1 of n, then we just don't say the associative conditions. Now, that's some crazy, ridiculous condition, but let me explain uh, why it's a useful thing to think about, why it makes all of the, the enumeration possible. The observation is that, so certainly every principal graph is a partial principal graph. We just said n equals depth p, and we forget that some of these sensitivity conditions hold. But the point is that on partial, partial principal graphs, there are some operations. Pn is a partial principal graph. And uh, P prime is obtained from P by deleting vertices of depth N and P prime from N is also a powerful principle. Okay? As long as you're deleting things sort of at this working depth n specified in the partial principle graph, you can only screw up associativity between places where we just don't care about it associativity. Okay? And uh, the other operation is that if you've got a partial principle graph uh, and n is actually bigger than the depth of, uh, of p, well, then we can reduce the working depth p n minus 1. Is also a partial principle graph. But what's going on here? Well, when we reduce the working depth n, suddenly we're um, we're just forgetting a bunch of associativity conditions. Okay, this is this is you know, the associativity conditions we insist on here are strictly weak in minus one. As long as there were no vertices whatsoever up at depth n, because otherwise we wouldn't. Even if there were vertices up at depth n, there, there would be some associativity conditions that had to hold here but didn't have to hold here. But if our working depth was actually up beyond the graph, so there were no vertices in the top depth, this works out. Okay. These operations are called reductions. Okay. Well, now. Uh, There are a few observations which quickly show us that this set PLD uh, is finite and, in fact, enumerable, or sort of practically enumerable. So, first of all, uh, there are only finite in many ways. To, uh, to reduce to a given partial principal graph. In one step. Okay, so what could this possibly mean? Well, if there are only finitely many, saying that there are finitely many ways to reduce to, to Pn is just the same as saying that there are only, sort of, if we start with Pn and undo one of these reductions, there are only finitely many results that actually sit in the set rigorously PLD. So, what's the idea? Well, if you added some vertices up at depth n, this partial principle graph, you'd be increasing the index. And in particular, all of those vertices that you add at depth n are going to have to be connected to some fixed, unchangeable set of vertices at depth n minus 1. So if we add too many vertices at depth n, then some of the vertices at depth n minus 1 by the Bugenhoff principle will, will get very high degree, and then the eigenvalue of the graph will become too high. So there's only finitely many ways in which we can add vertices at depth n in stable areas. And of course, there's only one way that you can increase the working depth. So the other possibility is to avoid it. Okay. And the other observation is that every partial principle graph can be reduced to the very boring partial principle graph, the empty graph, and the working depth is zero. 
all that you do is you just delete all the vertices at depth n, and then you reduce the working depth by one. Delete all the vertices at depth n, and reduce the working depth by one, and go all the way down to zero. And so this tells you that by applying the inverses of reductions, we can enumerate everything in the set by just uh, starting with this guy and applying the inverses of reductions. Okay? So, uh, so the corollary is that P all of B is finite. And in principle, we have a way of enumerating only one subset. Okay, we have two problems at this point. One is just a practical one, but it turns out an essential practical one, which is that a proof that a set is finite doesn't mean that in fact it's a good one. So we need a we need an efficient algorithm to produce everything. The second thing, of course, is that it's got this annoying restriction about the, of, of, of bounded depth at this point. We're going to have to make that go away. And since I'm starting to run out of time, I might have to decide between doing those two. Uh, let me focus on uh, on the, the problem of doing this efficiently, because I think this is sort of the, the, the interesting new part of what goes into the classification of sets. Okay. So there are three problems uh, when it comes to uh, efficiently enumerating this set. So what are these three problems? Well, basically the problem is that uh, just follow the outline that I described over there, we're going to produce the same element of this set many times over. That is, by applying the inverse of reductions by different paths, we'll end up getting the isomorphic graphs in different ways. So one way, we get two expansions. An expansion is just something that's inverse for a reduction. The two expansions of the same graph This is sort of a silly problem. There's no way of getting around it because I have to pay attention. Uh, so I just want to contrast this with the, uh, the later more simple <coughs> problems. So I could add a vertex connected to that, that top vertex. Or I could add a vertex connected to just have to avoid the amount of doing a limited amount of isomorphism. Two inequivalent expansions. So here, uh, these two expansions here were equivalent in the sense that there was a graph automorphism of the underlying graph that, that, took, uh, that took this graph into that graph. But you can have expansions which are inequivalent in the sense that the set of stuff, which the, 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 the set of, of old vertices which are receiving new edges. Uh, isn't taken to the, the set of stuff receiving new edges and the other expansion by another morphism, but then nevertheless the results are isomorphic. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a little bit subtle. And this is saying there's two ways of doing expansion, and there's a graph uh, isomorphism identifying them, but it doesn't restrict it to an automorphism of the graph just down the So. Example here. It's both, this is the smallest example we know of where this problem arises. And it's both rather complicated, uh, but also exceedingly simple relative to the graphs that we sometimes have to deal with in, uh, in doing this stuff. Uh, <coughs> Sorry about the discussion of water. Do you remember? Principal graphs with two components, and uh, in this case, we really need the two components. So, two graphs look very similar, but there's also some dual data that I want to specify here. Vertices are dual to each other vertices. I could either expand this graph in one way by adding a vertex here and a vertex there and declaring that those guys are dual to each other. Or, yeah, 
Um, I'll show you in a second. Yeah. Uh, these are grams only after isomorphism. I'm just going to show you that. Let me, let me draw the other one first, and then I'll say what's going on. Let's see what's going on. So the claim is that if you do either of these two expansions, you end up with isomorphic graphs. Is that one there? Okay. So what's the, the claim here? The claim is that, that in each of these graphs, one vertex is special. It's connected to something at higher depth. Okay? So let's think about what happens if I add the pair of green vertices. Well, here, I'm connecting the green vertices uh, to something that is not dual to the special vertex. It's dual of not the special vertex. Um, uh, nor even if you, uh, if not, not only is it not dual to the special vertex, if you walk down a step and come back up, it's not dual to the special vertex. On the other hand, if we do the, bl the blue addition, uh, that's not true. We can walk down a step and then back up and then use duality to get the special vertex. Okay? So these are inequivalent extensions. Graph automorphism to the white self, you're not doing the green expansion into the blue expansion, but nevertheless, if you stop and write everything up, you get a few guys in the graphs. So, this is a sort of awkward problem uh, and that we have to avoid. And when we do the real calculation where we process millions of graphs at once, this tends to actually dominate the, the producing things multiple times over because of this problem. Dominates the, the, dominates the time. So, in the remaining four minutes, let me explain the idea. The idea is canonical generation. And this is due to uh, a combinatorial graph theorist by the name of Kahn. So here we just define a collection of reductions of graphs to simple graphs. We want to do better than that. We want to pick our favorite reduction. For each graph, we look at the set of all reductions, order them somehow according to some measure, and then declare our favorite reduction for any given graph. And what happens? So after we've declared a favorite reduction, when enumerating, we consider all expansions. But only accept an expansion. Well, every expansion has an inverse reduction. Just undo what you just did, okay? So only accept an expansion if the inverse reduction, well, isn't your favorite reduction. It turns out you can't ask that. But you have to, you can ask that your inverse reduction is in the same <coughs> orbit under the automorphism group of the graph that you're expanding as your favorite reduction. Won't be attempt to explain the details, but this very simple idea uh, ends up having the result that you only uh, that you only produce one one copy of each isomorphism class in the simple graph. Now, there's a bunch of fine detail that goes into making this practical about how you do the choosing of favorites. Uh, you have to have access to sort of uh, graph canonical labeling algorithms to sometimes break ties to choose favorites. Between Otherwise, they're hard to decide between. Uh, and so we, we now rely on some, some other libraries of, of, uh, of graph, labeling, graph, lab, graph labeling libraries. But essentially, this idea gets rid of this problem and drastically <coughs> reduces the amount of time it takes to do uh, these sets. OK. Um, the final thing to say in just one minute uh, is, is how we get rid of this problem well, certainly D is a problem because these graphs, just the ANs, are certainly below index 4, uh, and certainly below index L for an interesting L, but have arbitrary depth. Okay? So certainly uh, we can't just restrict to D and, and be done. Here's what we can do, though. To define T, mapping uh, PLD to PLD plus 2, um, 
by just taking your graph and adding two extra edges on it. Really. So I think extending the super transit really helps you. What we're going to do is uh, restrict the problem to only look at uh, PLT super transitivity uh, at most three. And then after we've enumerated these sets, for, for all D, all the way up to infinity, we'll apply this T operator after the fact, arbitrarily many times. And then we'll know that all of our graphs are, uh, are, in, are in these sets of really. Now, if you get super lucky and have proved enough theorems along the way, due to various other people, for example, up there, it turns out that these sets, with the extra conditions that we now know about the principal graphs of subfactors, turn out to be finite sets. When you apply this operation again afterwards, these finite sets become infinite sets again, because we have to apply t arbitrarily many times. But there's a theorem that uh, in fact has been talked about at, at CGOA before, um, which is that if you fix a graph gamma and apply t arbitrarily many times, in this set of graphs, we're increasing the super transitivity at most finitely many, and effectively finitely can possibly be principal graphs of subfactors because of a number theory. So if this was finite, we blew them up to infinite sets again, but then we could cut them to the sets of finite sets. And that gives you some sort of the classification of possible principal graphs of subfactors up to a given index. If you were lucky, then you could show that these sets were finite. Stop it. This idea here um, already index five took a little bit of computer time um, and getting the three plus square root five is completely hopeless. It just goes down to big versions of this, which the new program just works like this. It says a few sets of it, but not many of them. Do you have any super points? Thank all the fantastic organizers uh, for a good lesson. Thank you.